Wow, it's really nice to talk about big things with smart people. So I'm delighted. I'm Mary Jordan. I'm a national correspondent for The Washington Post. And with me is Congressman Don Beyer. He's a Democrat from Virginia and a vice ranking member of the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. And we have Dr. Ellen Stofan. She is the director of one of the greatest museums in the world, the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum that nine, almost nine million people go through every single year. Amazing. From 2013 to 2016, she was the chief scientist at NASA. Um, also with us is Dr. Sandy Magnus. She is a retired astronaut who spent 157 days in space. <laughs> she flew the final mission of the US Space Shuttle in uh, 2011, and she is also the Executive Director Emeritus of the American Institute of Aeronautics. Uh, and we are so delighted that you're here today. Um, I want to remind people in the audience and are watching online that you can send messages, and I actually am going to get them. <laughs> um, if you want, hashtag transformers. Um, we're talking about leadership in space. And we just saw in the clip uh, John F. Kennedy. At that time in the Cold War, it was very clear. Russia, the United States, and we felt we won. We were the leader. I think it's kind of confusing now um, about who's leading. Who, who is leading the space uh, war? Well, I, I think we're, we're still very clearly leading, but we're not out there by ourselves anymore. Um, I think we, and part of the dilemma is we don't exactly know what China's doing, and even per, less so perhaps what Russia is. We are so transparent. All of NASA's successes are in the newspaper and on TV every day. Um, but to, to pile on to what um, Bill and Jim Bridenstine had said, uh, it is one of those rare places in Congress where there's a lot of bipartisan support. And in fact, I think the people that tend to volunteer for the Space Science, Science, Space, and Technology Committee are the ones who are most excited about it. So they are, they are the, the funnest hearings to go to, actually. So, so that's an important point, uh, especially these days. How bipartisan is it? I mean, is there... Is there support? I mean, don't some people think, really, do we want to throw billions of dollars into space when we could put a lot of kids to college? You don't get that much in Congress. In fact, I would say in the four years that I've been on the committee, the only real tensions have been over how much of the NASA budget should go for Earth planetary science. You know, the role that NASA plays in overseeing and understanding climate change. So if you're part of the subset on the committee that doesn't think climate change is real or that we can't do anything about it, they would rather have that $2 billion go to deep space. Um, but we've been able to work reasonable compromises so far that keep at least some of NASA's focus on, as, as Ellen has said, the most important planet there is, the one we live on. Yeah, and I'd like to also interject. Um, you know, we don't actually spend that money in space. Um, we spend it here in the United States in good jobs, in technology, in science. And to me, an investment in NASA is an investment in the future. I've actually, since this is a really good topic, um, in the 22 years that I've been out giving talks about what's been going on at NASA and in the space program, there's this perception that we're spending, oh my goodness, so much of the federal budget on space, and it's just, why are we doing that when we can do all these other things that need to happen? And then I explain to people that if you, know, if you take a dollar that you're gonna pay in taxes, and of that dollar, when I started at NASA in 1996, seven-tenths of a penny of that dollar was going to the NASA budget. Now it's more like five tenths of a penny. And then people are like, oh my gosh, we should be spending more in space because what we get out of our space program, to Ellen's point, is amazing. If you look at the, the daily lives that we lead and all of the, the convenience that we have and the technology advances that we've made, those have come from 50 years of government investment in space. And it's all for five to seven tenths of a penny on a dollar. And that's really not that much. And one could argue we should be spending more with that kind of return for our future. Can you explain what it looks like as America leads, but with you know, Japan and Russia and uh, private companies? What does that look like? And, and you bring up such an important point about the transparency of what other countries are doing. Um, and right now, we're paying a huge amount of money for one seat on a Russian rocket, right? Do we, do we want to be doing that? N no. 
<laughs> Absolutely. So we we need to have our own launch capability, and I think you know when we decided to retire the shuttles, there was this, uh, there was a strategic decision made that was very intelligent in the sense that the shuttle was designed to operate in low Earth orbit, and so and it was all it was getting old. It was working well beyond its design lifetime. And the thought was, OK, you know, we really need to focus on going beyond low Earth orbit, and this is a vehicle that we can't do it. So instead of spending money to refurbish the shuttle and stay in low Earth orbit, the, the country made a decision, rightly so, that, OK, we're going to make a new vehicle, and we're going to make that vehicle that can go beyond. And it was a really good plan. Now, unfortunately, the execution, you know, we got an A in strategy, and we got an F in execution, because ideally you don't want to retire your operational vehicle until you have your next operational vehicle in service. And we didn't plan accordingly for that, and so now we have this gap where we don't have U.S. launch capability, and, and the Russians are very good capitalists, and they've been raising the price of the Soyuz seats over the How years. How much does it cost, by the way? You know, I have been out of NASA for five years, so I don't know. It was about 20 or 30 million when I was... For one seat, for one, one seat. trip. When I was an astronaut, and I'm not sure what the price is, you'll have to ask NASA. And so, th this again, let's go back to what it's going to look like. You know, if there's a big push in the Trump administration, right, to 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 really be a leader, what does it look like with the private sector and other other company? And you know, are we going to be really trading all information with Japan and China and Russia? I don't know how much we'll trade, but certainly we, we've always been transparent. But I think the really big difference is the incredible growth of the commercial space industry. I mean, just in Northern Virginia and the metropolitan DC area, we have dozens of companies that are, are making their livings um, going out into space, and not just with satellites. So you have deliveries to the space station, you know, Sierra Nevada, Orbital ATK, which is now Northrop Grumman, the ULA launch, et cetera, et cetera. And this is really the great new frontier, is not just dependent on federal allocations, but on people that can figure out how to make money off of space. And, and I think if you want to think about what the future is going to look like, look at the International Space Station right now, where it's a partnership between the Europeans, the Japanese, the Russians, the United States, and the Canadians. It's being resupplied now by Orbital ATK, Northrop Grumman, and SpaceX. We're going to be launching crews uh, with Boeing and, and SpaceX. We're going to have Sierra Nevada de delivering. So there's private companies involved. There's other nations involved, and that's how we're going to get back to the moon and on to Mars. It's not going to be just the U.S. the way it was with Apollo. It's going to be in partnership with other countries, and it's going to be in partnership with the private sector, which is great. And As so someone whose life is on the line when you're up there in space, are you okay with this? I mean, it sounds like a lot of ways that something, whoops, I forgot that, and it's you know some other country's fault or some company's fault. How do you feel about all these actors that go into a rocket launch? So let me tie that in with your previous question about leadership, because the real the way you show leadership is you set the vision and show everyone, hey, this is what we think we should be doing. This is a great vision. Everybody, let's buy into this vision. And then you figure out ways to build the collaborative partnerships to make that vision a reality. And I think we're doing that. We've done that with the space station. I think what's going on now to your question, what's going on in the industry here in, in the US is very important, because after 50 years of government investment in space, it's hard. We know it's hard. It's going to continue to be hard. And we're going to continue to learn things. But after 50 years of investment in space, we're at this point where Private industry is going, hey, maybe there's something that I can do here, independent of just government, and we can create a new economy. And the government has said, OK, let's try that experiment. That's leadership, right? Trying that experiment. And so now we're working our way through that experiment. It started 10 or 15 years ago. It's going to go on for another 10 or 15 years, because space is hard. We've got to be patient. And you know, go back to a person who's going to be potentially, well, I won't be because I'm retired, but astronauts are going to be writing on it. I think um, we're eager to engage new ways to get in space. We want more people to have access to space. We want a broader experience for people in space. You go to space, you change your ideas about what it's like to be on the planet. And the more people, the better. We're going to learn a lot. We have to learn about safety. We have to learn about the, the uh, intersection of safety and profit. We have to make sure that we don't get complacent. And there's a lot of smart people at work trying to do that. And again, when we're talking about leadership, we, 9 million people go through your museum. Th that speaks, doesn't it, that people, it has caught the imagination. I think the previous panel said space is big. Space leads to other things. It's the future. So how do you, um, you know, get the public on board for this? Is it, maybe what we need from, from you is to say why it matters. We talked a little bit about it. But what is really, 
What, what do you see the short-term goals for why we're investing and want to lead in the space? Uh, well, I, I mean, to me, it boils down to, to two things. And granted, I'm biased because I'm a scientist. But when we think about why we want to send humans to Mars, it's because, as they were talking about in the last panel, we're scientifically convinced that it's likely that life evolved on Mars about three and a half billion years ago. So there's this scientific imperative to answer this question of are we alone in the solar system? So when you see us leading, you see us leading in finding extrasolar planets. You see us leading in going to the outer solar system and to Mars to look for life. And I think that's really compelling to the public. People want to know the answers to these questions. And when you saw things like Scott Kelly's year in space, when the public really got, wow, we're actually practicing to get ready to go to Mars, you saw a lot of public engagement and excitement. They want to know why. Why are we doing this? What are we going to learn? What's over that next hill? And I think there you engage the public. We also see just culturally, um, American people are so excited about the, the space outreach. So when you get The Martian, the book, the movie, or Interstellar, or now First Man, it, um, you know, the, the theaters are filled because it appeals to, to, to our deeper nature. And I really love the science piece of it because all biology and all chemistry is based on the physics. And so much of the important physics is going to be done in space. Um, you know, the nice part about the co commercial is it's freed up NASA to do ever more science with the James Webb Space Telescope and help you with W first and understanding about dark energy and dark matter and the cosmological constant and things that will ultimately affect all of our lives. Right now, if you have a lot of money and you're just a regular person, even though Bill, Bill Nye said he was denied being an astronaut, you can go up in space now if you have a lot of money, right? When um, there's a couple of companies that are going to be flying people suborbital of Virgin and Blue um, and for several hundred thousand dollars, so it's quite a bargain, you can have a suborbital experience where you would go up, you'd experience four or five minutes of microgravity, and you'd see the Earth, a beautiful view of the Earth, and then come back down. And so that's sort of the low ticket price right now, and I believe those two companies are hoping to fly in the next year or so. When do you think we'll see a lot of people and not just really rich people going uh, to space? That's really a hard question yeah. because um, it's all about the, loss, the launch costs. And there are several companies who are working on reusability to try and bring the launch cost down. But think about it. If you have to build your car every time you want to drive to the grocery store and then you throw your car away and then to go to the grocery store the next day you build another car, that's really not cheap, right? And so we're doing that with spacecraft. And so we really have to get and I, I hesitate to use the word routine, but we have to get into a much, uh, much more high rate of cadence of launches before costs come down, which would lower the price. I mean, are we going to see advertisement on the side of rockets to lower the cost? <laughs> well, that doesn't lower the cost. That just provides money from some other avenue to help pay for it. Right. You know, one of the things I think it's important to reflect on this year of all years is, um, as you see some, from some of these clips, we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Apollo missions. Um, just this last several weeks, Apollo 7, Apollo 8, as we move towards Christmas. You know, we went in eight years from having not enough infrastructure, not knowing how to do it, to putting humans on the moon. So when we say, how long is it going to take for space tourism, I think it depends on the will and the investment. And yeah. can we bring the cost down? I think it's totally possible we could see it in the next couple of decades if there's a will and if there's the investment. If we could put a man on the moon in eight years, I would argue we can do anything we put our minds to. I agree. One little measure is the number of people that volunteered for the one-way trip to Mars, <laughs> uh, which is really remarkable. Anyone in your district? <laughs> Actually, yeah. One, and, uh, I one don't woman, recommend that. And <laughs> she was married and she had stepchildren. We figured she probably didn't have a good relationship with her stepkids. <laughs> so it takes about six months to get to Mars one-way trip? Is that right? In the, with the right launch conditions, yeah. yeah. And it takes how long to get to the moon? Three days. Three days. Three days. OK, so we have been ping-ponging back uh, as a country, kind of first we were fixated on the moon. It's a fairly short trip. Uh, then it was Mars. Right under Obama, it was Mars. Then Now it's back to the moon. Um, and then Mars. And, and then Mars, right. So are we at the right place now? And how jarring is it when you have these long-term programs and you're supposed to lead it. How do you fix this so it doesn't really matter who is the director of the space agency or who is the president, that as a country we can kind of say we're in it for the long haul? 
So uh, let me speak as an operator. Um, as someone who flies, has flown in space and uses the equipment, it makes much more sense to test it in your backyard, i.e. the moon, before you commit to a journey across the ocean or to, to Mars. So I want to make sure that life support equipment is working well. I want to make sure oper operational scenarios are working well. I want to make sure we have you know, just a good set of tools before we send people on a six-month journey with a, a minimum uh, amount of abort to a safe place kind of thing. So for, for me, it always made sense that the path to Mars, and Mars is a good horizon goal, because as Ellen mentioned, there are very interesting things to go, to go there and discover, but goes through the moon, test it out, and then go beyond. Now, given where we are today with industry's interest, the question is, how can you go to the moon and make sure that the government stays focused on going to Mars, but yet leave enough infrastructure and dy dynamics and energy uh, in the vicinity of the moon so that industry can fill that void. So think about it, I use an expanding bubble, you know, with the government on the leading edge of the bubble taking us further and further away from the planet and industry kind of filling in behind. So you can build a good strategy to do that, and that is leadership. And so, so the, the moon essentially has, has a lot of water, so it has hydrogen oxygen, it has rocket fuel, right? So, it, I mean, this is what the vision is, is that it's gonna become a gas station for, the, for space. Is that the idea? I, I think so. At least that's, that's the primary justification, I think, that we've talked about at least on the committee. But to the larger picture, you know, we, we, the word, the phrase that keeps coming up is constancy of purpose. So from a NASA leadership standpoint, it's what's that big picture? Um, Jim's predecessor talked about science first and Mars second. And then from the pers congressional perspective, it's getting away from these awful con continuing resolutions where you never know what the NASA budget is gonna be until late in the year. And um, I'm hoping that that's where the bipartisanship leaders on Congress really is, is stable, increasing budgets. And how, how can you fix that? How can you kind of say, this is, space is big. This is bigger than us, as they said. And in this case, we're going to safeguard this through bipartisanship, through different presidents. I haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but it is a goal. It is a goal, but part... But actually, it, that runs all across Congress because everyone complains about the continuing resolutions and the bu budget uncertainty. And it's difficult to pull NASA out and give it budget uncertainty, give it budget certainty while no one else has it. But that, that should be a, a major national goal. And uh, now this, the, among many other reasons. On the Hill now, when, when people heard, your colleagues heard about the Space Force, what was the reaction to that? Um, at first, a great deal of skepticism, at least from the Democratic side. Uh, and I think most people are taking, a, a, at least on the Democratic side, a wait-and-see attitude, um, recognizing that Russia and China are doing lots of things in space, lots of things we don't know about. Um, some of them may have military aspects. Um, how secure are our satellites? Um, so there, there's a sense of let's move cautiously, thoughtfully forward um, in order to make sure that you know, we're making sure we're securing our assets. We don't want to accelerate the, the militarization of space at all, um, but we also don't want other people to do that while, while we're sitting helpless. How much of the safety factor, the, the military factor, goes into uh, our new focus on leading this fight? How worried are you as scientists that, that there is a, a big danger here of weaponizing space? I think one of the things that we can do at the museum is to sort of put this in its historical perspective, which is that we've always had a military presence in space. Being able to observe um, the world from space is, a, is an important vantage point, uh, and that's long been the history. So we've always had a civilian side uh, and a military side of space. And I think what, what all of us are certainly committed to is that we continue a strong, vigorous, science-based civilian space program moving humans to the moon and on to Mars and that the military continues to do what it needs to do in space to keep us all safe. I would just comment that um, it's important I think and you think about leadership and the importance of leadership in space in, ge in general is what are the behavioral norms that you want to establish for how human beings engage in a new frontier or in a new environment? And there, that's how I think the military piece comes in, because if, if you're not showing up and you're not engaging, how can you help set those behavioral norms? You know, maybe we could just end with, with each of you very quickly talking to people that don't think about the space program all that time. You know, they're, they're busy. They're, <laughs> they're uh, 
right now bringing their kids to school. Uh, I think that the country in the 60s, when we saw that clip, was very focused on it, right? And, and there was just this kind of the national pride in it. Um, why would you say it's important now to just an ordinary American? Well, you know, one of the things that we like to talk about at the museum is the fact that most of you probably got here today based on space. Um, every time you pick up your phone, whether it's the high resolution camera on your phone or the GPS that helped you uh, find your way here today, space is in your life every day, even if you don't know it. Um, from agriculture to communications to navigation, space data help us live a a safer, healthier life, and hopefully will help us learn how to take care of this planet better as we continue to move outward. So I think a lot of it is trying to get the public to realize you know, how critical space is to their everyday lives. So I will comment again as I've talked with the public over the last 22 years. Uh, people are interested in space. They are very excited. I remember after STS-135 when we were running around the country talking about that mission, a lot of people were very upset because they thought NASA was closing. So that really disturbed them because they take pride in our space program. It's funny because they're all very enthusiastic and they're very passionate, but they're not very well informed. And I think it goes back to your point where people have busy lives and they're, they're trying to live their lives. But there's a lot of pride in our country about our space program and people do care about it. I don't know if they really realize on a day-to-day -day basis the way, uh, as Ellen pointed out, how much it touches them, but the interest is out there and the, the the, the, it's, it's still out there. People are very proud of what we're doing. And I, I'd just offer two thoughts. One, I think it goes to the very core of what it means to be a human being, that we are always exploring, trying to reach beyond our limits, using our imagination. Um, it's, it, it's essential uh, for, for, for us to, to be able to grow. Uh, this other, other piece is that um, the, the insight into special and general relativity, the insight into quantum mechanics, just to begin with, is affecting now every part of our lives. And as we see, there was a piece the other day that said half of the jobs on the planet right now could be replaced by thinking machines. Right. Um, what are we going to do? We also discovered World Economic Forum had a report last week that shows that it is this commitment to science and technology that creates all the jobs that we're going to be doing in the future. Right. And NASA leads the way. Um, only 12 people have been on the moon, 12 Americans. Is that right? Mm -hmm. It's only 12, right? All men, actually, right? Yes. Okay, so you're one of the few people on the stage that's been into space, <laughs> and it, it, you haven't hit the moon, but I highly recommend it, by the way. Can you just <laughs> tell us, since I don't get to talk to astronauts every day, what does that feel like? Especially later, very soon, we're going to have a conversation about space tourism. I'd oh, like to hear from you. Gosh, I could go on for hours, but I will, I will. So a lot of astronauts, when they go to space, and you'll hear that probably later with the astronaut panel, is our perception of the world changes, because we're outside of it, and we're above it, and we're down, and we're looking in. And what you see is you see the planet and you see it as a spaceship. It's a closed system, it's a spaceship, just like the space station is a spaceship. There's an air system, there's a refiltration system, there's a water system, so our planet has all that. It's our spaceship. We are all crewmates on the same spaceship. And we're all connected to each other. And when astronauts talk about not seeing borders, that's what we mean, because it's just one planet, we're all members of that planet. And so it really changes your perception on what's important, how we all should be working together, what should we be focused on, how we need to take care of our spaceship because, oh, by the way, it looks very fragile. And so that's what, when you hear astronauts talk about the view from space, that's what we're all trying to articulate in our own language. And it's absolutely magical. And the more people who see that, the better we'll be as a species. So I'm, I look forward to having more and more people get into space, even if it's just for five minutes, to get this view and really understand and, and value our planet and not take it for granted. So that's my comment. So from up there, you don't see red America and blue America? <laughs> no. <laughs> and that in itself might be Yeah, we could a have another thing. conversation about that, but we probably ought not. Yeah. A lovely thing. Yeah. I think the first person on the Mars should be a woman. Definitely. <laughs> Although I'm, I'm so grateful you let me be on this panel too. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, it's been uh, a uh, uh, delight, as I say, to talk about things that's very interesting about bi bipartisanship. Um, I'll just end with this one thing. We're going to talk about this next. Is what is the support for the Space Council on the Hill? Um, we've not had any votes on it, but. I think in general it's going to be very supportive. 
Um, that, that space continues to be a priority. As I, as I mentioned earlier, it's one of those rare places where there's a, a lot of support on both sides. Uh, so I, I think we'll, we'll probably move forward. Terrific. Well, thank you very much for a terrific conversation. And now we'll move on. Great. Thanks. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mary.